awesome stuff planned tonight. Come in and grab a seat for a moment. Welcome to worship tonight. Tonight we are finishing off our series in Nehemiah. We've been six weeks journeying through the book of Nehemiah and I'm very, very excited uh, to be reaching the conclusion, the great big celebration, the, the end celebration of Nehemiah where we get to celebrate the completed walls. We've been journeying with Nehemiah right from being over in, in modern day Iran and Susu in the Persian Empire being a cupbearer to the king and tonight the walls are completed but more than that, more than just walls, a people are rebuilt. So I've been enjoying working our way through this series because Nehemiah, I reckon, speaks to us today because we are in a time of rebuilding. Our walls are rebuilt, but now the onus is on us to rebuild our church, to, 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 to train up a new generation of follower of Jesus here in Jeringong. So if you notice, as an announcement, a special welcome to our nephew Josh. So please make him feel welcome. I think the rest of us are all locals. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. If you're not already giving electronically, please do so by the timber box up at the door there. Please know that we have two prayer gatherings, one at 8 a.m. On a, on a Tuesday morning and one at 10.30 via Zoom on a Friday morning. The Quebec at Pie Drive is on again with a twist this year. Now, the Quebec at Pie Drive happens each year. We raise money for the work of Wiki at Kramer High School. This year, you can donate a pie to somebody else. So if you're not a pie eater, if you don't enjoy eating pies, I don't know who that might possibly be, but if you, if you don't enjoy, enjoy pies, you can, you can sow into the ministry of Salt Down in, in Bomaderry. A number of us are partner with the work of Salt. They do wonderful, wonderful work down there, wonderful ministry to the homeless down there. And so you can donate a pie to a family that really needs it. So see Herman or Lyndon Kalinan over the next couple of weeks and you can donate a pie rather than, well, in addition to ordering one for yourself. Uh, we've got elders and church council elections coming up over the coming weeks and it's going to happen actually on October the 25th. So you've got, you've got a month or two to be thinking, praying and discerning. If you are someone you know is gifted in Spiritual oversight. Elders are tasked with spiritual oversight. Their job is to spiritually oversee the church. Church council, their role is to make sure the nuts and bolts, uh, uh, that it all happens, the lights stay on. So if you know someone, or perhaps you yourself feel called into that role, please let myself or David Highmarsh, the chairperson of the congregation, know. I've got a few church councillors stepping down this year, so if you feel as if you would like to be on our church council, if you know someone, tap them on the shoulder, and we can make sure that they are nominated two weeks prior on October the 11th. If you weren't here last week, uh, you won't have seen this wonderful little video put together by Cameron Cooley. This is the Ration Challenge. Collecting cash, uh, if you would like to donate, well, Tara, so you just give Tara some cash, she'll happily take it off your hands for, for Cameron's uh, ration challenge. Also, after worship tonight, we have an evening service planning meeting. So if you're able to, if you could please stick around for an evening service planning meeting. We're going to plan out the rest of the year. So that's immediately following worship tonight. If you can stick around, please do so. Friends, let's commence our time together with a word of prayer. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to come together. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this privileged place, this privileged time, this people that we get to join with, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we pray that you might draw near. We pray that you might make us aware of your presence this evening. Father, we pray that as we conclude our journey with Nehemiah, we pray that you might be speaking to us through your word. We pray that you might give us ears to hear. We pray that you might be using this time to build up your people, to equip us for mission out in the world this week. And all the people said, Amen. for God so loved the world. Thank you, Van. Thank you. Um, what I usually like it, um, doing with, it's quite often we don't read the Bible as much as we should, so I thought it was a great idea to um, actually bring scripture to you at the church so we can see the scripture as well. So this one, um, God so loved the world, I don't know the Bible verses up there. Yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. And there's a verse in this song I love as well. It says, bring all your failures, bring your addictions, no matter what you've been doing during the week, um, what's been happening during the week, come lay them down before the cross and even just leave them at the door and um, as you come in here and worship and because um, Jesus is here, he's waiting there with open arms for you. So let's... Um, Obviously, obviously you can't sing um, or stand, but we're going to sing God so loved the world. So look at the words. Um, so the words, that's the word scripture, but also to worship with your heart as well. Let's go. God so loved the world. 
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen. Thank you, the Duffies. Well done. Thank you, guys. It's always uh, difficult. It's a strange time when the body of Christ can't lift our voices with you guys. So thank you so much. Are there any young folk with us today? Excellent. All right. So he has a kids talk for us. I believe it's a bit of an action video. So get ready to do some actions. At the 5.30 service and the kids clubs over the past few weeks, we've been hearing a bit about Nehemiah and how God has helped Nehemiah rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, I thought it was good for the kids to know not just how God helped Nehemiah, but that God still helps and protects us today. He doesn't give us a wall around us, but he does promise to always be with us. And one of the things that we've done over the last few weeks at Kids Club is we've been learning Psalm 9, verses 9 to 10 as a memory verse to help the kids know and remember that God is with them and he's protecting them and defending them. So I have a few actions to help us remember this memory verse. I'd like to teach it to you and then uh, you can do it in church while the kids are doing it in the Kids Club at the evening service. Uh, it starts, the Lord protects, we get our shield like the Captain America, the Lord protects those who suffer. He defends, so we're using our other arm to defend now, still Captain America style, them in times of trouble. Those who know the Lord we decided not to do this for no, but actually to touch our hearts because it's, it's more of a personal knowing. It's not just knowing facts about God, it's knowing that he loves us and that we are his. So those who know the Lord, trust him. Hold on fast to God and never let go. He will never leave those who come to him. It's from Psalms 9, 9 to 10. That's how you do it. Let's try and do this all together. So everyone up on your feet. I find it actually a bit easier into their actions when we're standing up. Thank you. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. The Lord defends those who suffer. He protects them in times of trouble. Those who know the Lord, trust him. He will never leave those who come to him. Psalm chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Let's start, just pause for a moment in prayer. We're going to give thanks for the offering. Uh, I think I might invite you to again just stand because we're going to offer ourselves, not just money, we're going to offer ourselves in, into service to God's kingdom. So let's, let's pray. Our loving and gracious God, thank you so much. Father, we praise you for you made the cosmos, you made the sun, the moon and the stars, you made this earth, everything that is in it, you made each of us. Each of us in your own image, each of us unique, so thank you, Father. Thank you that each of us are special. Each of us has a part to play in your kingdom. Father, we say thank you for the common everyday bits of grace, the, those simple occurrences of grace around us. Food in our bellies and warm clothes on our back, a roof over our head, a stable, prosperous society. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We also say thank you so much, Lord, for that very special outpouring of grace in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. We say thank you that, he, that you came and lived among us. We say thank you, Heavenly Father, that he showed us what love looks like. Father, we say thank you that he died our death in our place in order that we might live. Father, we say thank you that we don't need to be constantly atoning for our sins. Father, it is the price has been paid once and for all at the cross of Christ. Father, you gave us your best, so we give you our best. We give you the very best of our time, talent, and treasure. We don't give you the leftovers, Lord. We give you the first fruits of our lives. 
So we stand before you tonight, Father, and we say, here we are, take us, use us. We offer you our bodies as living sacrifices for you in service to your kingdom, wherever you may place us. Father, take all that we am, take all that we are, take all that we have and, and use it this week. Help us to be agents of reconciliation, reconciling a broken and hurting world back into right relationship with you, wherever you may place us this coming week. In Jesus' name, the people said, Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Well, we don't have a Bible reading tonight because tonight we're covering a lot of ground. We're going to uh, cover the final few chapters of Nehemiah, all but one. I'm going to leave the final chapter of Nehemiah up to you to go away and do some homework, some reading for yourself. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a postscript to Nehemiah, but tonight we're going to be cover, covering chapters 6 through to 12. So if you've got a Bible or an I think, get it out. We're going to be covering a, a, a lot of territory. Um, bring your Bibles along to church. It's always a good thing. Uh, some of the important passages will be up on the screen. If you want to take notes, if you want to follow along, it's always a, a good thing to do. So, uh, Nehemiah, uh, it's not in chronological order. It's at the very close of your Old Testament, 400 years before Christ. But it's, it's sort of before the po poetry, literature, before the Psalms and, and Proverbs. Nehemiah was a contemporary of Ezra and Malachi, right at the very close of the Old Testament. Uh, but your Old Testament is not in chronological order. So let's uh, see if you can jump open to Nehemiah chapter 6. Friends, let's pray. Loving Lord, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. And what we are not, please make us. And the people said. Well friends, they said it could never be done. They said they'd never get the work done. This rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls, this massive effort, this colossal effort, this superhuman effort. Oh, they're too weak, those Israelites. Those puny Judeans, they'll never get this job done. The job is far beyond. It's far too big a job. They don't have the materials. They don't have the manpower. Plus, even if they get close, we're going to come in and we're going to threaten them. If the threats don't work, we, we might actually come in and slaughter them while they sleep. So this was an unlikely job. It was a huge effort. We've been learning over the previous month and a half that, that Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king over in Persia, in modern-day Iran. He had reports back from the Promised Land, uh, back from his homeland. They'd been in exile now for about 140 years. And he gets reports that the walls of Jerusalem are in decay, that the nation is, is at risk of invasion. So his heart is broken. We learned that he was grieved at the state of his people. We challenged ourselves to ask, are we similarly grieved at the state of our nation and of our people? I hope that we are grieved that our country men and women are frankly just all about themselves, are living for themselves. Uh, we learned that he prayed. Uh, over the 13 chapters of Nehemiah, he's always shooting up these arrow prayers. He's always in communion with God, always taking the issues, his, he, the, the things that confront him to God, handing them over to him. He planned. He, he knew what he was doing. He was prepared for when the moment came and the king asked him what was wrong. He was able to say, I've got this burden on my heart. He was a trusted advisor of the king. So the king let him go a massive journey. From modern day Iran to Jerusalem, that's a huge journey. It would have taken months. The king gave him everything he needed. He got there. He rallied the troops. He was able to divide up the people and, and get them working, each person near their own house, each taking responsibility. He was able to deal with, with opposition, both external and tragically internal. And, and now, praise God, the walls are completed. The walls are up. Thanks, girls. We read in, the, in chapter 6 in verses 15 and 16. So the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elal. When our, all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. 52 days. This is an amazing effort. This is a superhuman effort. Indeed, this is a supernatural effort. I want you to see here that Nehemiah immediately gives credit back to God. Nehemiah could have taken the glory for himself. 
He could have taken the glory for himself and said, yep, I've, I've done this. But no, Nehemiah knew that this was ultimately God's work. He immediately credits God there in verse 16. Friend, even if you don't feel mighty, even if you don't feel as though you can do very much for God, know that this is an example where with, if God is in it, a little can be a lot. A little can be a lot. Nehemiah knew that he was God's man for a particular job. He was God's man where he was called to be, doing God's work for God's people, for God's glory. Uh, my testimony is that uh, having found my calling as a, in, into full-time ministry, it, it's been one of the great blessings of my life to know that I've, I've found my calling in life. Uh, being in ministry can sometimes be bloody hard work. It can be frustrating. It can sometimes be demoralizing. But it's not really hard work in the sense that when I used to actually go to work for a living for nine to five. When you're working in your area of giftedness, it doesn't feel so much like hard work at all. Can you say with confidence, I'm, I'm where God wants me to be. I'm about the task that God wants me to be about. I'm actually focused on the things and on the people that God is calling me to love and, and to serve and to draw into a closer relationship with Christ. Remember, Nehemiah wasn't a clergyman. Nehemiah was a, a lay person. He was a, a cupbearer to the king, like a servant, a trusted servant, certainly. But he was certainly the other day just a simple lay person. He wasn't a priest. Ezra is the priest in this situation. Nehemiah is like, like the governor. He's a He's a lay person, but God used him to get this mighty work done. So skipping over to chapter 8, the wall is finished, but now it's the people who need rebuilding. Nehemiah is more than just about a wall. This is about a community. This is about a city. This is about a people returning to God. It's about building a people. When you think about a building a people, it's actually much harder than building a wall. I tell people quite often, you know, church would be easy to manage if it wasn't for all the people wasn't for all the human beings, this thing we call church would be super easy. Um, but Nehemiah has nevertheless managed to do that as well. So we read in, in chapter 8 that all the people came together as one uh, in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till, till noon. How's that? As he faced the square before the water gate, the prince of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. <clears throat> Friends, here we see the people with a heart, with a passion for God's word. Friends, this is how revival happens. If you look back through history, whenever revival breaks out, and friend, aren't, aren't we praying for revival in our land? I know that I am. When we gather together on a Tuesday morning for prayer, and you know, you always often pray, just pray for our nation. Father, we want revival in our land. We want our fellow Aussies to, to, to realise that without God in their life, they're just living a life of stuff that's going to end and really not amount to very much. But if God is in it, uh, we know that they can outlive their life. All these revivals that we're praying for, that we've seen throughout history, were always preceded, always preceded by the church praying, but with a hunger for, for the word like this. Now, if you read back in chapter 7, you'll read that this is about 50,000 people. It's about 50,000 people gathering together, leaning in, less, listening to Ezra, Ezra the priest uh, preach the word. So understanding begins with hunger. In verse 1, what I love here is that it's the people who tell Ezra to bring the word. The people say to the priest, bring us the word. We want to be taught. We want to be fed. I love this. You should be demanding this of your preachers still today. Bring us the word. Feed us and, and teach us. Open up God's word and explain it to us. We read in 7 and 8 that, the, that, uh, that all the... The priests, they were out there amongst the people, explaining it all to the people. I sometimes wonder, how do they do this without a PA system with 50,000 people? We read that there were Levites and priests out there in the midst of the people explaining this, interpreting it, so that the people could actually understand what was going on. Now, their scriptures, remember, were the first five books of your Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, 
Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. You know that the revival is about to break out whenever people are hankering for more Leviticus, yeah? <laughs> Give us more Leviticus is what we want. But this is what they just wanted to know, what God's good life-giving law was. God doesn't give us laws to make our life a drudgery. He gives us good laws that make our life better, that when we submit to them, life goes easier for us in the land. And this is what they wanted. Friend, if you're clueless about the word, don't worry at all. We've all been there. We all started from somewhere. Uh, I, I really learned about scripture when I was, I was at uni. And, and I read the chronological Bible in a year, but it took me like three or four years. It's okay to make a start. I can recommend it to you. I can even find a few copies still online if you would like me to source for you a Bible reading plan. A few chapters every day. You'll knock it over in a year in chronological order. You'll understand how it all fits together. With Nehemiah being a key one, it's kind of out of whack, out of place, uh, being right towards the very end. Everyone that could understand was there, men and women. This church service went from dawn until noon. This is a six-hour church service, friends. How's that? Yeah, all right. That's what I want. Yeah, Mel Duffy, six hours next week. Evening service planning meeting tonight. Put it down, Swanee. So uh, this is 50,000 people leaning in. And, and I always... Every once in a while as minister, I get someone coming, pleading back to me, and they say something like, oh, Pete, you wouldn't believe it. I went to this church, one of these, you know, these crazy, Holy Ghost, crazy noise churches, and the service went on for an hour and a half. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. The preacher preached for like half an hour, 40 minutes he went on. And I, and I think, well, that's okay. Some preachers kind of get a bit carried away. But I always wonder, knowing... Well, how, what they were doing with the rest of their week, I always think, well, what is it that you were doing that was so important you had to get home for anyway? Like, okay, if you're going home to disarm a nuclear weapon, sure, leave you early, go. But for the rest of us, let's be honest, what else are you doing that's so important with your week? This is the most important time of our week. We need to make this our priority. We're breaking our net to worship here with the family, with the body of Christ each week. So when people come to me whinging that church blew out a little bit longer, I know it's, I, you're just going to be home watching Netflix. Like, you're not doing anything special. You're just going to be out and having a surf or down the bolo or something. It's not as if, you, that, that's, you know, you, the president isn't on the phone wanting to broker a peace deal in the Middle East. So whatever it is that you're doing, it's really okay to spend a bit of time in the Word. Like, deal with it. It's all right. And yes, it's up to the leadership of the church to make sure that that, that you spend our time fruitfully, that we're le learning and growing. But I want you to see that these people had a real hunger for the, for the word. They're leaning in and they're listening attentively. This is not like uh, watching a movie. They're, 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 they're leaning in and, and they're attentively listening. I heard a story about a, a flight. You know, when I jump on a plane, if any of you have travelled with me, you know that I put on my noise cancelling headphones and I'm just in the zone and I don't listen to the host is. I heard a story that they got so jack of this, of people not listening to their little pre-flight spiel, that they just started making things up. If you need any help with anything, please see a teenager because they know everything, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. It was a good line, but nobody laughed because nobody was paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> These people this day were paying attention. They were listening attentively. We need to be doing the same. So can I encourage you to be making notes, jotting things down, as we go here on, on a Sunday night. In verse 12, we read that they went away rejoicing from this six-hour sermon, this six-hour Bible reading. They went away rejoicing. Uh, and more than that, we read in verse 12, they went away preparing portions of food for those that had none. Listening to the word impacted their actions. They came away changed. They lived differently as a result of getting into the Word. We're told their joy was very great. How great? Very great. And in verse 17, we read that the Israel had not celebrated like this since the days of Joshua. What did Joshua do? Conquer the Promised Land. So they haven't celebrated since Jerusalem was first taken. So it's been centuries and centuries have passed. They haven't seen a celebration like this since the days of Joshua when the Promised Land was first 
taken so long ago. So, so this is the first thing they do. They gather around the scriptures. Uh, they, they gather and they want more of the word. They want to see what God is saying to them. And then in, in chapter 9, uh, a wonderful chapter. Let's give it over to chapter 9. Thanks, girls. Uh, we read in the opening verses of chapter 9, on the 24th day of the same month, they come back again. They come back, they go away, like they get some work in them, they realise, hang on for a second, we've got some more work to do, we've got some more business to do with God. So they come back again, they, they gather again, on the 24th of the month, uh, they gather together fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshipping the Lord, their God. Nehemiah chapter 9, friends, is the longest prayer in the Bible. How about that? It's a little bit of trivia for you. The longest prayer in the Bible. Nehemiah chapter 9. This is it. This is also the greatest description of the history. It's the greatest sort of uh, summation of Israel's history that you will find in the Bible here in Nehemiah chapter 9. It's a prayer that basically recalls and retells Israel's history. Uh, at the conclusion of the prayer, a covenant is, is renewed. This is a fresh start. This is a new beginning. They've heard God's word and now they're realising, oh no, we've, we really need to make a fresh start here. We really need to come to God and do some confessing and, and some praying. So we come away from Nehemiah chapter 9 so very thankful that God's mercy is greater than our sin. In Psalm 13 verses 3 to 4 we read, Lord, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. As I said, revival is always preceded by prayer and repentance, and that's what the Israelites are doing here now. They've got unfinished business with God. Now they, put, they sit in sackcloth, so they're, they're really repenting, and they put dust on their heads. They, put, they cover their heads. This is an expression of mourning. And of grief, of humiliation. By putting dirt on their heads, they're actually symbolically identifying with death. That's what they're doing. It's like they're saying we're buried or we feel we're, we're, we're dying to the old way of life. Of course, we followers of Jesus, the people of the new covenant, when we baptize someone down at Jeral, we say we are dying to sin, dying to the old self. The old Pete Chapman is gone. We're raising them back to new life. Death to self living for Christ. This is the Old Testament version, putting dust on your heads, symbolizing death to the old way, way of life. It must have been quite a scene. These people in sackcloth, dust on their heads, confessing to each other their, their sins. They came with empty stomachs. They were fasting. They were grieving. They wanted to genuinely put away their transgressions. We also read significantly that came apart from all the foreigners. Now we kind of think, yeah, Israel is always coming apart from the foreigners. Hang on for a second. Some of them were married to foreigners. So this hurt. This hurt. Verse 6, thanks girls, gives us the tone of the prayer. It starts off with praise. Always a good place to start your prayers. <laughs> you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on the seas and all that is in them. You gave life to everything and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Praise is always a good place to start your prayers. Can I encourage you to make Nehemiah chapter 9 a model for your prayers? Go away and have a look at it again. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, a great model for our prayers. It starts off with praise as we should. John Calvin said, thanks girls, John Calvin, the great reformer said, there is not one blade of grass there is not one colour in this world that is not intended to make us rejoice. This is what creation should do for us. You are a praise machine. That's what you are built for. Like a DVD player is built to spin that little disc and play a movie or a steam train is designed and built to chug on down that track. You are built. You are designed to praise God. It is what you were made to do. It is your highest calling. It is your, your highest purpose. 80 times in this chapter, 80, eight zero, 
The pronoun you or yours is used for God. God is the focus of this prayer, not themselves. And isn't that profound in this generation? <laughs> that I might not be the focus of my prayer. How about that? Think it has that for a mind-blowing concept. That I'm not the focus of my life. That I'm not the focus of my prayer. God is the focus here. Now this prayer covers some six cycles of Israel's history. It goes right back uh, to the stories of Moses and creation. It brings us right through to the present day. The pattern is the same over and over again. If you know your Old Testament, Israel sins, Israel rebels, they're punished, they come back to God and God is merciful over and over again. We read a history of this happening over and over again. Um, the failure of Israel is always matched by God's grace. This whole chapter is replete with because of God's faithfulness, God's blessings, God's grace, God's tender mercies, God's blessings over and over again. We come away so very thankful from Nehemiah chapter 9 that God's grace is so much bigger than our propensity for sin. Praise God. Isn't that good news? Over and over again, he forgives us. And of course, we followers of Jesus know that we don't have to keep going through these rituals like they had to with these slaying of bulls and calves and lambs and pigeons. The lamb has paid the price for our sin once and for all. Can I get an amen? Isn't that good news? There was confession of their sin. They, pray, they confessed their sin, theirs and that of their forebears. Remember, they're coming out of slavery. So that they're saying, listen, we want to turn away from that life. We want to come back to you, Lord. So confession is serious business. Repentance is a serious business. If we don't take confession and repentance seriously, it shows we haven't really taken sin seriously, and therefore we haven't really taken God seriously. So can I commend Nehemiah chapter 9 to you? It's a great place to start if you want help with your prayer life. If you want help with prayers, you've got 150 psalms to choose from. But try Nehemiah chapter 9. It's a great model, just remembering God's graciousness. And it helps you to sort of think about, well, how has God been gracious in my life? Great model for looking back over your life, over your life and seeing how, how God is at work and being, and being thankful. I'm wondering, how would, how would people think if they, if they heard your prayers? What would your prayer life tell people about you? Uh, they're, incredibly, they're incredibly honest uh, and, and they pour out their hearts before God. So we see in chapter 9, verse 38, towards the end of the chapter, they, they therefore renew their covenant with God. So they've come before God. The wall is completed. They've heard the scriptures. They've been convicted of their need for confession and repentance. They've done that. And now they say, right, oh, I'm ready to ink this deal. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing. And our leaders, our Levites, our priests are affixing their seals to it. The people made a solemn covenant, a written commitment to God. If you've rebelled against God, if you've wandered astray, if you've made some bad decisions, is there any hope for you? Nehemiah chapter 9 says, yes, amen. God is faithful. God is gracious. He will restore you. If you come before him, are honest with him and say, Lord, here I am. Here's, here I am in all of my brokenness, in all of my failure, all of my sin. Here I am. I bring myself to you. God will come and say, welcome home. Welcome home, prodigal son, prodigal daughter. He will run and embrace you. This is uh, the prodigal moment here of the Old Testament in Nehemiah chapter 9. In chapter 10, we read a huge big long list of names. I was thinking of getting someone to come and read all these names for you in, in, in chapter 10. I didn't want to make anyone do that. But it is basically a list of names. And it's important because each one of the names on that list, if you've got it open in front of you, chapter 10, is somebody saying... I'm in. Sign me up. I'm putting my hand up and I'm putting my name to this deal. So let me ask you, uh, are you in? Have you signed up for God? Are you signed up to his cause, to be a part of, of his people? It's a list there. Each one of those names is, is important. It goes down in, in history. But where is your name listed? Um, some of us might be lucky enough maybe to get our names mentioned in a history book somewhere, perhaps. Some of us might even put our names on the front of a book. But the most important book you want your name to be in, the most important list you want your name to be on is in the book of life. Amen? <laughs> Scripture repeatedly talks about the book of life. And that's the list you really want to be on. It's a list that really matters. 
No matter how much worldly success you have in life, it means nothing if your name isn't on that list. Jesus himself talks about it in Luke chapter 10, if you want to look it up. He sends the disciples out, and they're, they're out and they're smashing it, right? They're, they're casting out demons. They're performing miracles, and they come back, and they're pretty impressed with themselves. Oh, Lord, you wouldn't believe what we've done. We've cast out demons, performed miracles. And Jesus says, don't, don't be impressed with any of that stuff. Be impressed. Be, be full of joy that your names are in the book of life. That is what Jesus felt was important. Not all the spectacular stuff that your name is written on the roll, on the roll of life. So are you in, friend? Are you ready to ink your name on that list? If you haven't yet done so, if you're not sure tonight, please come to me. I will gladly ink your name on that list. We will pray and we will count you into God's kingdom. It will be the best decision you ever make. We also see at the end of chapter 10, uh, it's... After this confession and repentance and promise keeping, they actually change their ways. It's not just words, it's actions as well. They do so in three ways. Uh, and very quickly in, in verse 30, if you've got it open in front of you, um, they deal with marriage. They're going to stop giving their daughters in marriage to foreigners. Um, now this was not because of race, by the way. This was not a racial thing. It was a, it was a theological thing. It, it was a belief thing. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, we see foreigners marrying into the, the tribe of Israel, or the clan of Israel. Most famously, Ruth does it, doesn't she? She famously declares, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. It's not a case of, of, of race or ethnicity. It's a case of theology and of belief in, in God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do the righteous and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? If you're a person contemplating a relationship with someone, um, you need to make sure that this person is a follower of Jesus. It's just a bad thing to, to not have this most important relationship in common with, with your partner in life. Uh, some people, of course, are there in that situation. Uh, Peter, by the way, in the New Testament tells us that you should stay married to that person to seek to win them. To Christ, but can I encourage you when it comes to issues of marriage? You want a, a godly man, a godly woman in your life who you can do life together with. If you don't even agree on who God is, it's going to make for a, a very difficult relationship. Secondly, on the Sabbath in verse 31, um, they agree to keep the Sabbath, they haven't been keeping the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, friends, is more than just rest. Yes, our bodies, physical bodies, need rest. But as followers of Jesus, this is more than just a physical rest. This is an eternal rest. This is, this is a rest uh, in, in Christ. We look forward to that day. It's a shadow of things to come, Colossians tells us. Paul in Colossians says the Sabbath is actually just a sign. It's like a wedding band. It's a sign of things to come. Keeping a Sabbath is a sign of your trust in God. Keeping a Sabbath, keeping a day off, having one day off in seven was not a normal thing back then. For many people still today, it's not a thing. If you're a working class grunt, if you're out there working for a living, you got up every day and you went to work hoping to earn enough for your family to feed them that night. This one day off in seven, that wasn't, that's not normal. That's not a natural thing. If you were wealthy, you could just kick back and relax every day. But if you were a poor working person, you, Israel was strange for telling its people to have a day off. They were saying, look, I'm putting my trust in God to provide. It was a witness to the surrounding nations and, and Israel again commits to doing just that. Of course again as followers of Jesus it's more than just physical rest. Uh, we in Jesus we have a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. We have a foretaste of, of glory divine that our eternal future is secured. Our Sabbath day is a foreshadowing of that rest when we will all dwell in that in the new Jerusalem of which we'll hear about in just a moment. Finally there's uh, verse 32 to 39 that they, they, their heart is moved and they change their actions in, in the form of giving and supporting the temple. So they make sure that the priests and the Levites, the temple is take, is, they're not just hoarding their money for themselves, they're generous. This is a systematic series of giving. It's generous and it's sacrificial. Jerry Gong, in our case, we have a budget of around over $200,000 per annum just to pay the bills, just to keep the light. So you can have a look around the room and do the sums for yourself. It requires sacrificial giving. I know many of you are doing just that. I want to say thank you for those of you who are giving sacrificially, giving till it hurts, 
tithe and going above and beyond. These people in these days had a bare minimum of 10%. That was sort of the rule of thumb. We followers of Jesus, people of the New Covenant, there's never a percentage mentioned. But let's, let's be honest, are we really going to let Old Covenant people outgive us? Are we really going to let people of the Old Covenant outgive us by only giving 10%? Some of us, of course, we can afford to give a lot more than 10%, but it's going to mean more than just a five or a tenner in the offering. If you're only giving back to God, really what you spend at a coffee shop, I'm sorry, friend, but that is an insult to God. It's about time someone named it. This is, we're going through a bit of a tough financial time. I know everybody is. It's a tough time. Can I encourage you um, that your church family, God needs to be your first call on your resources. And this is exactly what they do here. Moving on to chapter 12, it's time to party and to give thanks. Another huge celebration. They've come together, right? They've heard God's word read from dawn to midday. They've realized they've got business to do with God. They, they repent, uh, that they, they confess their sins, and now they come back again, and it is time to party. Verses 31 to 38 of chapter 12 present this amazing image. It's really the central image, the crowning glory of the book of Nehemiah, of these two choirs, this dueling choir. Were they dueling, Leonie? They were singing in unison. They were complimenting each other, singing in harmony. Two choirs, not one, but two choirs up on the walls of Jerusalem, going in different directions. So, thanks girls. Ne uh, chapter 10, verses 31-38 say, I, was, I, the leaders of Judah, go up on the top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right towards the Dung Gate. Not the best neighbourhood to be living in near the Dung Gate, but that's okay. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall together with half the people. They're now walking around on top of the wall. Remember back in the early stages, Tobiah, the Ammonites, said, Oh, these walls are so puny. If even a fox ran up on top of them, they'd collapse. Now they have musicians and choir members and the whole community walking around on these walls. That's some fox, isn't it, Toby? <laughs> Ezra led the first choir and Nehemiah was with the second choir. The two groups circle the walls and come together at, at the spiritual center of the nation at the temple. They come together at the temple. Now in the Old Testament, you need to understand what this is doing. This isn't just going for a walk. They are claiming the city for God. In the Old Testament, if you walked around a city, you were claiming it for God. That is what they are doing. They are reclaiming Jerusalem for God. Can I encourage you to think about maybe doing the same thing for your town, for your suburb? Uh, when you're out and about walking, be praying. Go for a prayer walk. Maybe we should organise a prayer walk around our town and just bathe it in prayer, ring it in prayer. When you're out and about, be praying for the people in the houses or the people passing you by on the street. Silent prayers. They don't need to know. But I encourage you to be praying for your town. I encourage you to be praying for your people. Maybe we should organise a few, a few prayer walks. I know some of you have done that in the past. We should do that again. That's what the people do. They're claiming... Uh, Jerusalem for God. Again, they, they start with praise. They start up with choirs and singing. And can I encourage you to think that praise is a kind of a barometer for your spiritual vitality, both individually and as a church family. Uh, praise flows when our heart is full, when our heart is cold and empty. Our praise sometimes rings a little bit hollow, doesn't it? Do you know that other religions don't sing? There's other religions that don't sing at all. They might chant or maybe the priests sing. The reason for that is because, frankly, they don't have the gospel. Christians sing in good times and in bad. We've always been a, pray, a singing people. Music has always been at the centre of what we do, which is why these times are a little bit hard. We can't sing along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a really difficult time because we're not able to, to do that. Uh, Martin Luther, thanks girls, so there's another great reformer who kicked off the Reformation 500 years ago. He said, next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. The gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man that he should proclaim the word of God through music. I got some new uh, headphones for uh, Father's Day today. Some new one of those new fancy flash ones, those wireless ones. It's called Bluetooth. <laughs> anyway. I've got a whole iPod full of songs. I don't know. It's weeks worth of music. Now, thousands and thousands of songs over the last 40 years of my life. I've got every one that I like. And then I've bought them, keep adding to it all the time. 
But whenever I, uh, I can start listening to some country music, some rock, some akadaka, some classical music, a little bit of everything, but I always come back to praise because it is the most powerful form of music, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I reckon music was made for praise. Praise, what praise music is, is the reason why God gave us the gift of, of music. And Christians sing in good times and in bad. Christians sing when people die. I mean, how strange is that? Have you thought about that? I've been to lots of funerals, I'm sure you have as well, outside of churches. I can assure you there's no singing going on in any of those funerals. They might play a bit of Slim Dusty. He was a good bloke, you know. I've got nothing against Slim. I'm all for Slim. But compared to a Christian funeral where the body of Christ comes together, and says we're sending this person home. The praise that we, some of the best praise times I've had have been down in that little stone, humble little stone church down here. As we send off one of our own and we send them home. Because we sing even though we are sad, even though we're sad that they're no longer with us, Christians sing in good times and in bad. Our praise flows even when conditions aren't ideal. Remember that was the situation for Jerusalem here. They were still in some pretty tough times. They were still recovering from a financial crisis. They had enemy nations around them wanting to come in and slaughter them. So this was still a really hard time. But nevertheless, they are praising, they are praising God. Uh, Proverbs says, a joyful heart is good medicine. A joyful heart is good medicine. Uh, and then in verse 43, thanks girls. Uh, and on that day, they offered great sacrifices. Uh, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. W women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard where? Far away. Our praise isn't just for ourselves. How far away is your praise heard? Now, we've got some pretty strict rules in here that the council has put on us. We can't just crank out the praise like they do in, say, Islamic countries or in India where from the crack of dawn you're hearing multiple competing loud hailers coming at you from every direction. So we can't blast our worship out to the neighbourhood. But there's lots of other ways. We're doing it right here every week. We're blasting our worship out to the world. Praise God, what wonderful technology, what marvellous times we live in. But even just in your own life, how, how loud is your praise? Does it live loud in you, I'm wondering? As I said, to praise God is what we were made for. Praise and adoration is the perfect antidote to that selfish nature that is the source of all sin. We have every reason to adore God, to sing His praises for what He has done for us in Christ because the tomb is empty. Raymond Brown, who was an American Catholic priest, he said, Christianity is the happiest religion in the world. Other worshippers rarely hurry to their shrines or temples with happy spirits. And William Barclay, who some of us know was a wonderful Scottish Bible commentator, said this. He said, a gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. If any of you know a gloomy Christian, tell them they're a contradiction in terms. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. And nothing in all of religious history has done Christians more harm than its connection with black clothes and long faces. Isn't that true? I run into people like that all the time. They tell me, oh, Pete, I went to this school and it was all been made to go to chapel and these blokes and these little... They're inoculated against the gospel. It's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy when we don't embody the joy that we have in Christ, when we are the ones in those black clothes and long faces. Even at a funeral, you'll know, if you pick that up, I never, I make a point of wearing a bright coloured tie at every funeral I do. Because it's not... In, in death, it does not. You know, death doesn't hold any fear for us as followers of Jesus. So we can worship even when we don't feel happy. Joy is not dependent upon our circumstances. Happiness depends on the state of our heart, not on the circumstances around us. So they were pleased to give. Again, there was giving. They made sure that, that all the giving was done. Again, they're generous to the temple, generous to the people. No one went without. In conclusion... I want to leave you with a simple little observation, but a profound one about the book of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of these walls. This little rebuilding of Jerusalem, this is actually a little microcosm. It's a little metaphor for the entire sweep of human history. All of human history will come together one day in the new Jerusalem. And Nehemiah provides for us just a little glimpse, 
just a little shadow perhaps of what is to come. Do you know that all of history is moving towards a day when all people, all people who have their names written in that book of life from every tribe and every tongue will come together like they did then and worship God in a new Jerusalem, a heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. What we do here on a Sunday is just a little glimpse. What we do here on a Sunday when the, when the family comes together, we provide just a little glimpse, just a little snapshot of, of what our eternal future will be in Christ. So, Frank, can I encourage you that if, to think that if you don't enjoy this now, what makes you think you're going to enjoy it then? Final little challenge for you. But I've got a final reading from Revelation uh, 21, this is from. Revelation 5, sorry. Revelation 5 says this. I, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Friends, what a wonderful fresh start that will be. Amen? This will be the greatest do-over in history. This will be a, a, a third exodus. The original exodus, of course, is what the people were remembering here in this story. They experienced a second exodus, back from slavery, back to Jerusalem. And, and we look forward to a third exodus to Jerusalem. But a new Jerusalem, a heavenly Jerusalem. There's no need for a sun. God himself will be our light. The streets will be paved with gold as if that matters, because God will be there dwelling with us. This is our future if we are in Christ, if our names are added to that list. All the peoples on earth, from every tribe and every tongue, singing God's praises, where 10,000 years is, is but a day. What a wonderful day that will be. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we look forward to that day. We look forward to that day when, when people from every tribe and tongue will come together and sing your praises as one. So, Father, as the people of Jerusalem in, in that day came together to rebuild, so too we ask for your help in rebuilding in our day. Here in Australia in 2020, there is much work to be done, Lord. We want to come before you and confess our sins. We have been. We've been fearful to speak up. We've been fearful of our neighbours, what our friends might think or say of us. We've been... Struggling with terrible fear of man issues, Father. So we are sorry we repent of that. We turn away from that, Lord. We turn away from all that is not of you. We've been content with second best, Lord. We put you so far down our priorities list, Father, that we struggle to even gather with the family. We struggle to open your word or to come to you in prayer. We repent of that, Lord. We leave that behind and commit to gathering afresh to encouraging our brothers and sisters in Christ. We commit afresh to, like Nehemiah, saying, Here I am, Lord. Take me, use me, use my hands. Use the gifts you've given me. Use the resources you've given me to serve. So, Father, like Nehemiah, be revealing those Kairos moments to us, those little opportunities that you might provide for us. Help us, like Nehemiah, to be bold, and courageous to be dogged, to not be put off by the opposition, to not be put off by the enemy, to not be put off by the slings and arrows and barbs and threats. Help us to be about your business, building your people for your glory here in Jericho. In Jesus' name, the people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, Muddy's got some prayers for our world. Thanks, brother. What did you find? Because there's a lot in there. How fast they built the wall. <laughs> 52 days? Wouldn't get done that time now, don't you? Not with OHS. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 They were pretty committed. Anyone else? How the enemies, they knew that God must have been with them. With yeah. Them. They did it, mate. In fact, it's, if, you go, if you haven't read it, go home and read Nehemiah and you'll find that theme goes all the way through it. What the enemies thought. What the enemies thought. 
next stage. What the enemies thought, what they did, how they tried to derail it. And in the end, they were like, there's also another chapter at the end after Pete said, go home and read the very last chapter of Nehemiah, because there's another twist to it. But I won't tell you, and neither did Pete. So go home and read it. It actually doesn't finish where we finish tonight. Anyone else? Let's How pray. Prepared they were oh, sorry, to sorry. For so long. Say again. How prepared they were to, to come together and, and worship and, mm. and learn mm. for, for so long, and, and they didn't just do it once. They, mm. they did it again. Mm. Shows you how we are a community of believers. They didn't all go off to their own houses and do that. They got together for a long time. Anything else? Pam? Um, I've, I've done a lot of prayer walking in my time. Mm. But walk and, and the Lord's often told me to walk around a, a city or walk around a building. or And I've never, well, I don't know how you put it, like you're marking your territory. How did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> we can do that too if we want to, too. <laughs> I think there's laws against that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, so in the Old Testament, walking around a city was the, the people's way of claiming it claiming. from God. That was the word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dyslexic kid. No, 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 it's good. It's good. I was thinking, Pam, as people saw about that, I know Pam does prayer walks, and maybe if you want to do a prayer walk, Pam is actually the right person to talk to. Yeah. Don't make me this church. Yeah. It's a really, really interesting book. Go home and read it, and you'll see the whole story, as Pete said, a mirror of what, what we're meant to be doing, coming back to God, but seeing the reality of opposition, saying, no, no, no. Praying for the world. It's Father's Day. Okay, so many dads here have had a good time. Some dads here might not have had a good time. We've got to remember that. Uh, some people here haven't got their dads anymore. Some people here, uh, and we know in our community, maybe not people here, but uh, in our community, some dads have lost their kids recently. You know, look, yellow pom poms. That's what's behind it. It's not just youth suicide. Family members have lost family members. I was thinking, okay, Father's Day. What does God say about parents? He says we're meant to care for the orphans. That comes into Father's Day, understanding our role as fathers. And the big one is God is our Father. Jesus brought in this concept, this reality, that we can talk to God as Father. Because back in Nehemiah's time, Father wasn't used, that concept and that relationship. So I thought we could be here for uh, six hours, actually, or a quarter of a day, and just praying about fathers around the world and us as fathers or us as kids, because we're... Or when you might not be a, a bloke who's got a son or a daughter, but you are a kid who's got a father. So we're all in on this. It's for everyone. Uh, how about we pray? And I'll leave some quiet time as you, you have a pray about someone in relation to a father relationship. Whether they have, whether they don't, and what's needed. I'll pray. Holy Father, the only reason we can say that is because Jesus said we could. You are holy, you are great, and at the same time, you see us as your children, and we also see you as our dad. We really can't understand that, not fully. But we trust Jesus that we can call you Dad. And that you do love us like a dad loves us. We thank you for the revolutionary way you have broken into our world, whether it's in a relationship like that between you and us, or how you have called us to be like that to others. To love people with that type of family love. 
we thank you for that example and how that can dramatically change this world. Some of us here, God, have had a great day celebrating fatherhood, whether we're kids or dads. But then, you know, there's some people here, Lord, me included, and I haven't seen my dad for ages. So we lift everyone up here, Lord, to you, trusting you as the great father, trusting you for um, our joys and our sorrows in relation to this. Lord, we want people in this world to really understand your father love. All the people in this world who all have fathers, whether they're with them or not, may they all experience your love, your fatherly protection, your fatherly desire to hold them and to put them on the right track. You know, think of the prodigal son story, Jesus, that you told, and how the father wanted to love the, the young fella even though he'd stuffed up. We pray that this world would come to understand your fatherly love and how that can change every aspect of their lives. We pray that that reality would be known by our world leaders, who all have fathers, who all desire fatherly love, and are now in a role of leading nations. My mind boggles as to how what that can do, but I do know that your fatherly love can radically, <coughs> can radically change them. I think about the people in our town who are grieving as dads and the people throughout the world at the moment who are grieving because they've lost kids or people have lost dads, people have lost mums. And I pray that we would all come back to that reality again, that there is an ultimate Father who loves us, even in the chaos we're in. I pray for all the orphans, Lord. Uh, I think about Light Home and some of those who haven't got dads or the ones who have been sent there because their dads want the best for them. I pray for the, the, the ones who have lost that critical aspect of their life, that you would Give them deep peace that oh, defies understanding in that reality. Help us all as we move on in life and lose our, our parents. Help us to trust you for that. Help us as parents to be able to impart the reality and the truth of you to our kids. We're not very good at it, Lord. You fail all the time, but I pray that you'd help us to do that. And your fatherly love would be a reality in our own families. Pray, Lord, for the church as we try to show your love to others. This generous, providing, caring, protecting, uh, fatherly love. Help us to be dynamic in Jeringong as to how to do that, whether it's as individuals, with our, our neighbours and our mates, or whether it's as a, as a Christian community to our community. May your fatherly love be obvious in this world. All over the world. May it break through different religious fears and uh, incorrect understandings of you. May it break through the poverty and the the cycles of poverty that leaves people left without protection, without this fatherly love and protection, may it break into our own lives and dynamically revolutionise us to understand you have shown us the greatest way of love. Thank you very much. I thank you that I can be a dad and I thank you for the joy that is and pray that our, all our children will grow closer and closer to you. Holy Father, in your Son's name, Holy Father, we pray. Thank you that he told us we could call you Father. Amen.
Have you ever gone to the, um, a river or a creek and you jumped off your paddleboard or jumped off your kayak and all of a sudden <laughs> stuck in the mud? And you just, no matter what you do, you just, you've got a shoe on, you've lost it. And I'm sure if you, um, if you ever get in that situation, I'm sure you had jeans and socks on, I'm sure if you lifted up your leg, that probably won't be there by the time you put your leg out. But um, I was, the reason why I was asking that, because I wanted to know what miry clay meant. And that's what it is, that really thick mud that you just get stuck in. And um, there actually was something I was going to share tonight, um, just conscious of the time. So there's a reason why I sing, I chose this song tonight. So I'm going to give a very brief abbreviation of it. And um, during the COVID time, there was a lot of time of separation. And um, I'm going to be honest, I think it's possibly that I may have myself drifted away as well from God. And my focus changed dramatically on things such as teaching from, um, teaching from home to kids, eight hours on the screen, and everything just, just went into chaos. Um, and I was always too tired, I was on the lounge when I had time, and I was too wide up to go to bed. There were so many distractions that um, I'm actually a trained competent singer, you probably know that, but, um, but you are a gracious congregation, so thank you very much for that. Um, but I used to love streaming, strumming and playing the guitar and singing um, God's Word, but I got to a stage where I just felt embarrassed to sing. Um, I didn't want to sing anymore. I actually remember the day I packed up the guitar and put it away for a while. And um, there was opportunities to play at church and record at church, and I chose not to be there and do that. And um, I just didn't want to lead anymore. I just didn't want to do this anymore. And there was a time when I'm thinking, what's well, the right time to speak to Peter and say, I don't want to lead worship anymore. I just, I've, I've done. And, um, I remember Pete was asking for someone to lead a drive-in, a car drive-in church, and they were stuck. And I thought, well, I'll just do it for the interim, but I've just got to find out the right time to speak to Peter so I don't want to do this anymore. And, um, and I didn't put the guitar away, and there was a time I found myself going back to the guitar and just playing some scripture songs and so forth, and this song kept popping up all the time. And um, it was quite weird. I just wanted to try to do this, but at the same time, not be involved. And... Um, it's an old song I know, but it just could be back to back together. It brings me back to um, the Psalm 40, 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud, and he set my feet on the rock. He gave me a third place to stand. I love the line where it says, lifted me out of the pit, the pit of despair. Now I'm not going to ask you, what's your pit? And uh, maybe the pit of despair could be 2020, I don't know. Um, he put a song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. I love that word, their trust. God stays with the, when the rest of the world seems to be walking away. He always remains true. And no matter what the rise and fall of things such as politics and what the world views are and the diseases and catastrophes, the thing is that God remains. And if your soul is weary or trouble seeking comfort, wherever it may be, um, have you been in a familiar pit? I don't know. So reflect on Pete's talk tonight and also look at the Psalms as well. Um, please use this following time as a time to reflect and pray. I'll be still just for a little while in the middle and for you to have time so you think about where you are and what your pit is as well. Mm.
Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the mighty clay. You set my feet upon the rock. Now I know. And I love you. And I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my close friend, and I will worship you until the very end. up to you. Many times we find ourselves in the pit. We pray to whatever the pit that people are in, what happened, or what you put them in. Bring those times up to you. Bring us out of that pit and put us in firm ground.
Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go, my Savior, my closest friend, and I will worship you till the very end. Do you love it this week? When we are in that Murray Clay, Lord, that the sun put on solid ground. Pray, Lord, that we look for the, um, our Bible, read our Bibles, Lord, and it's been encouragement this week of what to do. Be with us, walk with us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.